Thank you very much uh, for having me here. I'm just going to try and work out. There should be a flicker here. I'm not too sure how it works. Right. OK, so I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to go straight to the point. So uh, at the Oxford Man Institute, we've been working quite a bit on the, I would call, unintended consequences of AI in electronic markets. So I'll give you a summary of some of our findings, which are quite relevant, especially you know, to those executing these uh, sort of strategies, which is pretty much everybody in electronic markets, whether bond markets or equity markets, and for regulators. So, you know, I'm just going to focus on the last uh, bullet point. If you look at how trading has evolved over the last 50 years, so we went from manual trading, floor trading, to electronic trading, then the internet and computer power and data have allowed us to move, to move on. I think uh, the flash crash in 2010 put you know, the, high, the spotlight on algorithmic trading. And now more recently, we've moved to, to sort of you know, more computing power, more data available for decisions. So all of these algorithms are not only sort of executing orders, but are, are also learning. They're designed to learn how to trade as they move along. And that's quite, that's quite an interesting academic question, but it's also quite an interesting sort of question for society as a whole. So, of course, one would expect that these uh, algorithms or learning algos will be, you know, beneficial to society or to the markets. You would expect that prices reflect uh, a little bit more all of the information available at the time one wants to buy or wants to, wants to sell, so that's price efficiency, that's great. You would also perhaps hope that the costs of trading will be lower. That, that has to be proven. Uh, decisions are data-driven rather than people feeling emotional about a particular situation. So again, that could be beneficial. Uh, the fact that there's more information and more data patterns that are being scooped up by all of these machines May, may make you look in directions that you hadn't looked otherwise and then find risks where you didn't see them and so on. So, you know, after all, interconnectedness and data patterns will help you uh, in many ways. Diversify a portfolio, manage risk better, and so on. My talk is more about the unintended consequences. Um, so I'll focus more on the right-hand side of that slide, where we have found, so I won't bore you with the studies, I, I'm very happy to talk to anybody later on, that these learning algorithms will learn how to manipulate the market, will learn how to coordinate actions with other learning algorithms to try and manipulate the market, will learn to collude and lead the market to super competitive, uh, super competitive outcomes, and so on. I'll give a few more details about that. Of course, they can lead you to disorderly trading and so on, but uh, my research has focused on, on those uh, three points I've written there. So actually, to understand why that might be the case, and I'll come to how likely it is for that to be the case, you know, let's think of what is a learning algorithm. You know, I hear everybody talking about AI, machine learning, data science. I never know what people mean. But for me, a learning algorithm is a very basic box, okay, that has an objective. And normally the objective would be to maximize profits, to minimize costs, to do something. So you need to code this. Remember, you, if you are going to be trading in electronic markets, you have to code these machines. They have to be able to be quick enough to process information and all of the data around, which is quite a bit, need to make decisions quickly, send them to the, to the exchanges, and so on. So they, they can't be too complicated. So then you also give them a set of actions. Okay, it could be buy, sell, do nothing, make liquidity, make liquidity on the bid, make liquidity on the ask, you know, whatever you want, you give it a set of actions. And importantly, you have to give the machine a set of rules to choose among all potential actions, okay? So all of this is hardwired. In the same way, you need to hardwire a rule to update the rule. So that's an important aspect of a machine making trading decisions, which is you also have to code how rules are going to be improved or how rules are going to be evolving as you trade along or when you, or, or when you train uh, the machine before actually deploying anything in the market. And those rules that are updated with other rules normally do it on current and performance of what's going on, okay? So you look at past actions, 
and uh, you might want to sort of stick to those. Uh, you also want to incorporate new data. You also want to see how the environment has changed as you uh, as you've been acting. So they're proactive and adaptive in that sense. And a very important aspect of it is you have to also hardwire or code into these machines how to exploit something that works. So normally you want to stick to actions or the machine will stick to actions that have worked well in the past, have delivered something you know, of the objective, have, you know, profits are great or costs are very low, but also the machine will explore. So machines are designed to explore other actions that you don't know much about, you have not used much, about in, uh, much of them in the past, but this exploration is quite important. You know, when you do things manually, or when you sit down and you sort of uh, think, think what is the best, best cause of action, you might leave things out there that are very intuitively wrong for you, but the machines will explore anything. And that's where, you know, is a, an important aspect of how these AI machines would work, which is they'll try and explore as much as they can or as much as you allow them to explore every single corner of potential actions and, and reaction in the environment to produce the objective, which is to either maximize profits or minimize costs. But the last point is perhaps a very important one and an important one for my talk and my research, which is you do not endow machines with a moral compass. Machines don't know right from wrong. Machines are given a set of actions with a very precise objective, and the unintended consequences that we might not like will pop up if the machine thought that that was the optimal thing to do. So our research finds a couple of things, which is these algos will learn to manipulate the market. For example, if an algorithm understands that there's some predictive, predictive signals out there in the market, signals that people are using to predict behavior or predict prices, predict trends. Therefore, people will act on those signals or other machines will be acting on those signals. And these machines will learn that these predictive signals are an important thing to look at. But not only will they see that these are important and they'll read them off and act on them, they will also try and rig these signals in a way that they can take advantage of other people's reactions to these signals. For example, if you're trading in a limit order book, there's, you know, most people will look at the demand and supply pressure that is you know, very visible in a limit order book. And uh, normally many decisions of many algorithms uh, will be taking into account buy and sell pressure in, the, in, in electronic books. And therefore, machines will pick up on this and will try and rig them. So this might sound to some people as spoofing, and that might be something that machines will end up doing a lot more than otherwise. Uh, or I call it, you know, quote-based manipulation, but the, the black boxes will learn it. Then the machines will also learn how other people react to their own actions and will try and entice other algorithms into actions. And in the end, we don't know what the final outcome is, but all of these actions and reactions will be learned by these machines eventually. You know, quickly or slowly is uh, difficult to tell, depending on the market you're looking at, how much information uh, you have, and how, how often you're trading to see uh, how other traders react to your own actions. Then another important point that we, we find in our studies is collusion. And this is kind of a very loaded word. And this is, to me, you know, unintended collusion. Okay, no one, I don't think anybody out there is training machines to misbehave in the market. Okay, so when I said before machines have no moral compass, that's true, but the people who are designing them do have a moral compass, and they're not trying to sort of build boxes that will rig the market. But the machines don't know any of this stuff, and they will end up coordinating actions to help each other manipulate the market, to take turns manipulating the market, to take turns uh, manipulating predictive signals, and uh, some of these outcomes clearly will be super competitive outcomes. They're not great for the integrity of the market. And many of these will be sustained by reward punishment mechanisms. And that's an important sort of, uh, sort of concept because collusion properly defined has to be because if you deviate, I will punish you. So machines will learn 
punishment strategies to make the other sort of toe the line. But many of these super competitive outcomes will not be sustained by reward punishment, but will still deliver outcomes which are not competitive. Okay, our machines don't know that, they just coordinate into an outcome that both machines like, or N machines like, N traders using N machines, and that's where the equilibrium will be. It's not competitive, and this basic tenet of competition that uh, you think the players will sort of be driven to the competitive outcome, well here the machines will coordinate into actions that will not deliver what we expect them to. Um, to. Then, how likely is this? So the question is, you know, this is, you know, my studies are a lot of theory and a lot of empirical stuff to support them. Now the question, how likely is, is it that, that you will see collusion, manipulation, and so on in these markets? Well, it's, it's, it's still, the jury's still out there to see you know, what will happen. But there's four things we find in our studies which drive the probability of seeing a bad outcome, let's say, which is not a competitive outcome, pop up. If everybody is using the, the same data to trade their boxes, it is much more likely that you will see collusion, that you will see manipulation of signals and so on. The back testing, believe it or not, is crucial. When you trade, uh, when you train these boxes offline, you back test, you need to find ways in which you are going to set the ball rolling in the market when the black boxes start to trade, and the way you normally pick uh, where you start will drive the market into uh, super competitive outcomes. Um, what other black boxes are doing and how they're learning, you know, if they're too similar, you might be more likely to end up in outcomes with manipulation and collusion. And the crucial one, which is again a basic tenet of competition, is a number of competitors, okay? And when, when one thinks about electronic markets, I normally think of many players making markets, many players trying to you know, optimize their own objective, but the competition among them will drive the market to uh, a competitive you know, state or competitive prices. And I'm going to conclude with one slide, which is not in fixed income, but it's equity, because I have this, uh, you know, I can look at this data, I don't have the uh, bond data. And then you ask yourself, Euronext next Amsterdam, how many people are really making markets or trading? Who, you know, what is the market share of all of these players? So I'm gonna focus only on the last uh, uh, row in, in the interest of time. So if I look at shares, on average, one big player is already 30% of the market share. If I look at the top five players, roughly half of the market share is among five players. If I look at ETFs, which are, some of them are huge, uh, one firm alone, on average, is not the same firm, right? But if I look at every ETF and look at who is the largest you know, player in that particular ETF, on average, they take 60% of the market share. And if I look at the top five in ETFs, roughly 90% of the market share. So when you look at these, uh, uh, you know, all of this put together, the, the, the message is, well, one has to be aware, two, understand machines don't have a moral compass, but will look for the best, uh, sort of the optimal uh, outcome for you. Uh, whether they behave or not is a different thing. And there are four basic things that will lead you to non-competitive outcomes, one of which is market share and one that I think one, one should start uh, looking at a little bit more carefully, although it's a classical question in competition, but here again, it's right there uh, on the spotlight. Thank you, I'll conclude. I don't know if I overran, but...